Good evening, and welcome to Northshire Bookstore. My name is Davith Wood, one of the event managers here. Please type any questions uh, you have tonight into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. I'll save those up and pose them for you toward the end of tonight's event. It is my pleasure to introduce Justin Gregg for his new book, If Nietzsche Were a Narwhal, What Animal Intelligence Reveals About Human Stupidity. Justin Gregg is a senior research associate with the Dolphin Communication Project and an adjunct professor at St. Francis Xavier University, where he lectures on animal behavior and cognition. Originally from Vermont, Justin studied the echolocation abilities of wild dolphins in Japan and the Bahamas. He currently lives in rural Nova Scotia, where he writes about science and contemplates the inner lives of the crows that live near his home. The New York Times called his new book, If Nietzsche Were a Narwhal, undeniably entertaining. The Wall Street Journal called it nothing less than brilliant, and a review in The Baffler said a must-read that examines how to save the world only if we exist in symbiosis with the thinking, feeling creatures that have had the misfortune of sharing the planet with us. We are lucky to be joined tonight by Barbara J. King, Professor Emerita of Anthropology at William, and Mary, at William and Mary, and a freelance science writer and public speaker and author of seven books, most recently Animals Best Friends, putting compassion to work for animals in captivity and the wild. Her book, How Animals Grieve, has been translated into seven languages, and her TED Talk on animal love and grief has received over three and a half million views. And Barbara regularly reviews books for both NPR and the TLS. Please join me in welcoming to Northshire, Barbara J. King and Justin Gregg. And then I'll throw up in the chat links to both their books. All right, Barbara, take it away. <laughs> okay, well, good evening, everybody. And thank you so much to both Northshire Bookstore and also to Justin for inviting me to participate in this conversation tonight. So I'm going to start off, Justin, by saying how much I enjoyed your book. Uh, we just heard some of the wonderful kudos it has received. I noted that the New York Times refers to it as clever and provocative, and I agree. Just to get us started and to warm us up, I think that our work intersects around animals pretty clearly. Sometimes we look at animals in their own right and sometimes comparatively with humans throughout human evolution. So I'm speaking here tonight from Southeastern Virginia, surrounded by five rescued cats. And I wonder if you could tell us about the animals in your life and please include the chickens. Uh, yes, I have a cat, Oscar, who's also uh, a rescue. So he's a bit uh, ornery and a bit violent at times, but that's that's who he is. And there are my chickens. I have 10 chickens, a rooster and nine hens that are, they're, they're laying uh, hens, so they produce eggs, uh, but um, they live out in my barn in this giant enclosure as high up in the rafters as they can possibly go. Uh, because I'm just fascinated with their behavior and with their welfare and their cognition. So I'm trying to make an enclosure that makes them as happy as possible. And they've got like half an acre worth of outdoor area, all fenced off from the coyotes. So um, yeah. yes, I raised the money of them from chicks. Some we got as, as rescues. Uh, and so they're very friendly. I have some lap chickens that are much friendlier than my cat. Uh, and then a bunch of crows uh, that I have been feeding generation, we're on the third generation. Uh, of a, a family of crows that has lived in the trees above the chickens um, and we feed them in the mornings uh, and one of them says hello because every time I throw them food I say hello and he says hello back it's the it's the father of the batch so those are my animals wonderful so you're surrounded by mammalian and bird sentience and consciousness and I think one of the things we'll be talking about tonight of course is human exceptionalism and this persistent idea that some members of our species have that we are the best and the brightest in the whole animal kingdom. And I know that you have some things to say about that. Uh, one of my favorite sentences in the whole book, I'm just going to read from page 255, human intelligence is not the miracle of evolution we like to think it is. So throughout tonight, I'd like to talk to you about some of the downsides of human intelligence and to ask what are the consequences of those downsides and what we can do about them. But to start with the basics, okay, you're a dolphin biologist, you've chosen the narwhal and you've chosen Nietzsche. So why, why each of these two creatures? Well, the, Nietzsche specifically because he has a passage where he wrote about watching cows in a field and he was lamenting that oh he wished he was 
it could be as stupid as a cow so he wouldn't have to worry about all the things he worries about because cows he was saying he was writing incorrectly are living in the moment never thinking about the past or the future um so he he envied that but he also felt bad for the cows because they couldn't contemplate their existence so he was of two minds thinking about cows uh, so he's the perfect example of someone who, you know, who was using animal intelligence as maybe a good thing, maybe a bad thing, maybe human intelligence was a good thing or a bad thing. But if you look at his own life, he was miserable. And he was miserable. He spent a lot of time thinking about nihilism and things and thinking too much certainly caused him a lot of misery. So he's the perfect example of maybe human intelligence isn't all that great. It caused a lot of misery for him. Maybe the cows are better off. And then Narwhal, because it's the only mammal, marine mammal that alliterates with Nietzsche. So it seemed, <laughs> it seemed, seemed like a good title, and, but it's easy because narwhals are they're all in the family of uh, intelligent uh, toothed whales. Easy to wrap them into an argument. Okay. All right. So when we launch into your book, one of the things that we come to right away is talking about the evolution of human cognition sort of around being a why specialist, humans really being invested in understanding causal inference versus say a chimpanzee, a narwhal, somebody else. Can you talk about that a little bit about, you know, how that evolved for us? What's the significance of it in the framing of your book? Yeah, and I juxtapose that against uh, learned association. So general learning that all animals have been doing for millions of years, it's very powerful. It's still one of the main ways humans learn and do anything. And, and even when we were homo sapiens walking around, we use learned associations most of the time. But we had this, that, as you know, this weird ability to be interested in causal inference, cause and effect. We started asking why things happened. Uh, and And wanted to know the underlying mechanisms that caused one thing to happen, uh, which we, for animals, there is, is some evidence that they are interested in that in some examples, but for the most part, they, they, they don't ask that sort of question. Whereas when you look at everything humans do now, our science, our, you know, engineering, it's really built off of causal inference. So even though we didn't use it a lot in the beginning of the evolution of our species, it is now really the cornerstone of of our societies and our cultures and our civilization. So that's why I, I, I start off with that because that seems like the big thing. I mean, because you've studied, you've, of course you've studied primates and primate evolution. Does that sort of match up with the way uh, some, uh, is, would you consider that one of the major differences between human and, and non-human animal cognition? Yeah, I mean, I guess, yes. I think one of the things that attracted me a lot to your book is that you don't think in binaries, you think in continuous. So when you're talking about um, causal inference or metacognition or episodic foresight, all of which we can define in just a moment, um, you're not saying that animals never do these things. You're saying that they do them. They may not do them in the same way that we do them, and they may, may not do them as, you know, elegantly or as profoundly. And I think that, that that works for me pretty well. I mean, one thing that I do think about a lot is you know, at one point you sort of talk about chimpanzees and they're in the wild and okay, they're not using asking why questions. And I, I don't always know how we would know. So one thing that it would be interesting for me to hear you talk about is this relationship between observable behavior, what we can see and, you know, what's going on in their heads. So how would we assure ourselves that we really know what to look for in, let's stick with Let's stick with causal inference. Let's stick with the why. So we're not in an experimental situation in the laboratory where we can kind of control conditions and ask questions of these apes, but we're out there watching them. And we could think of Jane Goodall's long-term site in Tanzania or Jill Preutz's long-term site in Senegal or any place. So the, the, the issue for me kind of comes down to that whole question of how do we know what to look for? Yeah, no, it's it's a great question because the problem has always been in this field that if if you don't see evidence of it in animals, you assume mm -hmm. it's not there, and that's usually because you're asking the wrong questions, either in observation or experiment. Uh, so yeah, there's no reason to think a crow is not sitting on the edge of my railing, contemplating its existence and going through an ex existential crisis, and it understands a lot more uh, in terms of causal inference than we than we understand about mm -hmm. it. That's 
probably true because we know <laughs> everything we know about animal research is that we're finding more and more they do things we didn't expect. Mm -hmm. That has to be true. Um, but so the evidence that you look for isn't necessarily in, in what the animals are doing, but the argument just has to be for humans mm -hmm. when it comes to things like language or the, the you know, sending a rocket to Mars. It ha the only way that that's explainable is through causal inference. And so if you don't see that in animals, um, the only thing you conclude is that um, they aren't using that ability to build rockets and go to space. And maybe, maybe they do have the capacity, they just, it does, it's not necessary for them. Um, but I, again, I would assume if they did have it, it's to, not to the same extent. It seems to be part and parcel of everything a human does. Um, right. Whereas if a, a, you know, a great ape is doing it with its tool making perhaps, uh, it's just not leading to the same ends. So yes, absence of evidence doesn't mean evidence of absence, but um, but yeah, I look to I look to the things that have been created, and the only explanation could possibly be language or causal inference. All right, and so you take this in the book to conclude quite often that maybe our intelligence isn't the best thing. You know, it's not best for human society. It's not even best for our own happiness and our own pleasure and our own satisfaction in life. So the ability to have all this causal inference and thinking deeply about things sometimes leads us to places that aren't that great. And we could talk about any number of things here. Um, I'd like to talk about grief and responses to death, and I'd like to talk about human moral reasoning. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where you'd like to start, but if we could go down one of those paths. Yes. Let, well, I mean, moral reasoning pops out of, I guess, these first understandings yeah. of mortality. And so I, as, you, as you know, I quote you quite a bit in this in the section on, on death wisdom, um, because there's a lot, you're quite famous. By the way, I should mention, I'm very excited to be speaking with you because <laughs> for all of you listening, Barbara King has been writing a lot of really interesting, influential books, including ones that influenced my career and brought me to where I am. So it's very oh, much a well, pleasure. Thank you. Thank um, you. And so, yes, yeah, so um, so an understanding of death, it, it, I talk about it in the book as being sometimes controversial to use the term grief in our field. We all know how mm -hmm. that goes. Um, but I do talk about the philosopher Susanna Monceau, who, who's mm -hmm. trying to sort of operationalize what exactly is an understanding and on what level. So I'm just curious as to your thoughts on how how you would identify grief and what grief even is. And does it require a very sophisticated knowledge of what death is or or as Susanna Monceau might argue, a less sophisticated knowledge? Yeah, I think in my work, I am not requiring a concept of death because I'm really looking at this visible expression of emotion. You know, later you talk about qualia as a private experience, but visibly sort of evident in certain ways. So my definition of grief really is looking at this visible change in survivors after a death so that a survivor may go into extreme social withdrawal or a failure to eat and sleep well or species specific expressions of distress through the body the gestures the face the voice and i think that the emotional experience is is very clear to me across taxa you know cetaceans and primates and elephants and companion animals and farmed animals you often see a survivor really go into a sort of an emotional tailspin and be unable to recover after a death and the problem, of course, with that is it becomes very difficult to tell what is the cognitive understanding if I'm looking at the emotional expression. So for Susanna Monceau, as you know, she talks about animals being able to understand and many animals being able to understand two specific things, which is non-functionality and irreversibility. So the idea that you look at someone else and you realize that they're just in a different state, a non-functional state, and that this is not changing and it's not going to change. And I do accept that argument. I think your argument is rather brilliant. Mm -hmm. So I think that it is possible to bring together the emotional and the cognitive, but kind of what I am saying, I think, is that so often we like to think that we have the most profound emotional experiences. And I'm not at all convinced that that's true, whatever the cognitive basis may be. And so I do agree with you in terms of mortality salience, if you'd like to define that. I mean, I think that you, your argument, if I'm putting this correctly, is that we are often more anguished because even beyond understanding these things that Susanna Monceau talks about, 
that maybe an animal is not going to get up and function and be in our world with us again, we know that not only have they died, but we ourselves are going to die and everybody, you know, is going to die. And that, that makes our lives harder. Yeah, I think that's it. I mean, I would I would fundamentally agree with you that in that moment of grief, the, there's no difference between the level mm -hmm. of grief for us or for an animal. The grief is real. It's there. We're experiencing it, I would argue, uh, subjectively in the same mm -hmm. way. But then the real bummer for our species is that three months later, we could be sitting having a coffee and suddenly have this feeling of like, ah, I myself will one day die. It's an intellectual exercise. And, but it leads to an emotional response. And I suspect, unless you have that full-blown death wisdom, uh, that it, other animals might not experience that. And I think that is, I mean, I, there's arguments as to why that is useful for us, for planning our behavior, for regulating our emotions. At, and there are lots of good reasons, or for creating our cultural things, including yeah. religion. Um, but on balance, I argue in the book, I, I, I really think it is a negative for us. That that knowledge is tied into depressions of of you know a diagnosis of depression and other things. Mm -hmm. It isn't generally a bummer. So, so yeah, that's how I think of uh, of death wisdom. Yeah, and I think what what you're doing there is threading that line that anthropologists try to thread all the time. You know, we are, or I'll speak for myself. I'm trying to sort of resist human exceptionalism, which you do so beautifully in the book to understand that even when we're different, it doesn't automatically mean that we're better or our cognition leads to better outcomes. And at the same time to recognize that of course there's human uniqueness. I mean, biological evolution and understanding of evolutionary theory compels us to understand that of course we're unique in a number of ways. And it may very well be the case that this type of thinking around our mortality and around the mortality of others, which can be just so, so, I don't know, just searing uh puts us in that category and i wondered if you could talk about the anecdote you you wrote about your young daughter and in terms of this sort of coming to an awareness of of mortality sailing so that really stuck with me yeah it was it was a big it, it remains a painful moment for me and this was you know eight years ago when she was i think seven or eight uh and before that she was you know, linguistically capable, intelligent, doing all these cognitive things that we talk about that's unique to our species and which is just fascinating, smart, great. And then in that moment, she switched into someone who suddenly knew that she was going to one day die and she could verbalize what that meant. I, 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 the moment was I heard her crying after we put her to bed, went into our bedroom and she was sitting up in bed and saying like, I'm thinking about death and then I'll close my eyes one day and I'll never open them again. I'll never be able to move or think. Mm -hmm. And she was sad. And before that, that thought had not occurred to her. And mm -hmm. now she's age 14. She still has that thought all of the time. It is a guiding a part of her life mm -hmm. is, is built around this concept. And it just makes me bummed out because there, there is a version of us, <laughs> of her when she was five, when that wasn't a problem and mm -hmm. things were better, I feel like, for her. Uh, but in a way, it, the cat's out of the bag for us. Like it's an in inevitable result of the way we think. And there's, and so that is the sort of knock-on effect of our form of intelligence. And as I argue in the book, because we always are talking about human intelligence being more sophisticated mm -hmm. or exceptional. And I, the whole book is written to say like, okay, in those cases where that might be true, why do you assume that's better? And in this case, yes. I don't think that's better. Yeah, as a parent, I really relate to that. And I'm sorry to bring up something that's painful, but I think many of us who are parents have had that experience of, of watching sort of an individual whom we love or beloved to us, you know, enter into this new mental world. And, you know, we've talked about the animals with whom we share our lives. And, and because my husband and I have so many, many cats, we've lost a number of cats over the years. And one thing that consoles us is when we're, at the last moment, you know, we're giving them that final gift of love, which is to have them put down so they don't suffer if they have some kind of terminal illness. You know, we talk about how they're they're going to the vet, they're we're holding them, you know, they they're not aware. They're not aware of uh, they're aware of many, many things. Clearly, we know this, but of that 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 they are about to no longer exist. I don't have any reason to think that that they're aware of that. So yeah, you're saying that you know this this efflorescence of intelligence doesn't always lead to better things. And if we could 
broaden that out, like when you get closer to the end of the book, and we can certainly go back to the middle, but the end of the book is so powerful because you're talking about our our inability to really take what we know from all this why thinking and our mental time travel and our metacognition and everything else and really apply it to help the world that we live in today because we are not wired to really think of threats that are not immediate. And maybe you could speak about that. Yeah, and and that's something I ter- I term prognostic myopia, which is this idea that we have the capacity to think about the far future and to envision ourselves in the far future, or to even envision a future that's so far out that we're not around. This is a, something we can do intellectually, but our biology, as the biology of all things, uh, all animals, is has always been designed to deal with problems in the here and now, or maybe a little bit in the yeah. future, mm-hmm. a few hours, or maybe the maybe tomorrow or the next day. But we. Nothing in this system was designed to give us an emotional response to a hypothetical intellectual concept of 30 years from now. And so when we make decisions, it's those decisions are often still based on things happening in the present. And this is the explanation, of course, as to why we make such poor decisions about the future. Why, uh, why for example, the climate change issue is so difficult to solve because we aren't acting in the moment in a panicky kind of way, which we should be if 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 we're really thinking about what life would be like 200 years from now, uh, because our brains aren't designed for that. We sort of want to maintain status quo. And that's sad. Like you say, like we we have the capacity, and then you write about this as well when you're talking about dealing with animals, uh, having compassion and changing our relationship with animals. We understand that they are suffering and we, we understand uh, how our behavior harms animals, but we seem to be having a hard time stopping ourselves from doing the things we've always done, from eating meet from from supporting these industries uh, am i wrong in in saying that that those things are related oh yeah you're right uh so in this book animals best friends when i write about compassion you know i'm i'm asking people how many reasons are there to try to reduce our consumption of meat and dairy there are many of course and animal suffering is one, our own health is another, but the health of the planet is of course intensely urgent now. And we know that animal agriculture has a significant contribution to greenhouse gases and global warming and all of this. And so there are a number of scientists writing in the Guardian newspaper, and of course also in scientific peer reviewed journals that one of the best things that we can do is to try to reduce our consumption of these foods. Now, I'm not suggesting that it's it's like our personal responsibility to go out and try to fix you know, the climate crisis. We really need governmental action, legislative action, corporate action. But at the same time, this is something that we can do three times a day to help animals, help ourselves and help the planet. And, you know, I'm far, far from perfect. I mean, one of the things that I like about your book is that you write with humility and that's something I try to do too. I'm not suggesting that, you know, I've got the answers or I've got the behaviors down, but it's, it's not that difficult to attempt to reduce and change our patterns for many of us, not for everybody in the world. And yet what I'm coming up against over and over and over is exactly sort of the, the, the sequelae, the examples of what you talk about in your book. You know, people will say, yeah, I'm eating a little less, less beef. And I, I don't know, I really just can't get in the groove with that. I'm just not really doing it. And it's as if, because it's not happening right now, it's easy just to go on with your life. And I think that it's it's an immensely frustrating situation to be in that is sort of a trap of our own evolution that very much speaks to the, the entire theme of your book. So I talk about how, you know, how can we compel ourselves to think differently. How do we get that message out? And I ask the same question about animals in biomedical laboratories, because I do think also in a similar vein that what we're asking of animals who are biomedical subjects causes them a lot of suffering and isn't actually helping our health. I don't think that the way that it's framed as being animal research necessary to help cure humans' diseases is actually consonant with the scientific research. And yet it's the way that we've done things. It's the culture that we have. Mm. And it's very, very difficult to change that. Yeah. uh, In your book, Animal's Best Friend, there's an example that really speaks to me, and that's the spider example. You you talk about the wolf spider in your house, 
Uh, and how your initial reaction, which is based again on these immediate in the moment, mm -hmm. irrational emotional fears is you fear spiders and you would smush a spider. But over the years, you've had to rethink that and train yourself to to now, as you talk about in the end of a co cohabitate with wolf spiders in your house, sometimes you allow them to run around and, and but <laughs> yeah. it, it sounds like you're 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 battling the difference between your intellectual understanding of what that spider is and what obligation you have toward that spider morally and this <laughs> visceral fear of spiders which most people have so that's right. kind of it's similar in a way to everyone's oh, yeah. reaction to eating food and 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 climate change issues this mm -hmm. all sort of all wrapped up into that same thing yeah and you're very nice not to say this but i'll explain that the what i write about in the book is when i saw this was many years ago i saw these two wolf spiders in a room in my house i was all alone they were kind of large I thought I was freaked out I thought they were kind of looking at me and I took a shoe and I beat them and I put them down the toilet and then I thought to myself what am I doing I'm an anthropologist who's writing about other animal lives who's writing about compassion and this 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 can't be this kind of cognitive dissonance is just is absurd and so I really did have to start out on an intellectual path of observing spiders reading science of spiders and so I now am feeling sort of in love with spiders. I'm smitten with them, the orb weavers around my house, the wolf spiders in my house, et cetera. But what an enormous amount of effort for one little thing, one yeah. person, one house spider. So, you know, if you scale that up and you see what we're dealing with, I guess one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, you know, is there hope for us? I mean, we, I don't think either you or I are particularly deterministic about evolution. So where does that leave us in thinking about where we're going in the future? I I I go back and forth depending on my mood in the day uh, thinking about mm -hmm. this question. Sometimes I'm really quite hopeless uh, and sometimes I'm hopeful. Uh, I, I think the reality of what's going to happen if I had to make just a guess sort of, is that people aren't going to change their behavior governments aren't because really it's governments aren't going yeah, to change their behavior quickly enough to prevent very bad things from happening but once very bad things are undeniably happening as they're starting to at the moment um people will change themselves because suddenly it's in the moment they see the issue and they they can move quickly if they need to and so i think the hope comes in that there will be a sort of global collective realization which sparks fear and immediate uh, change and then then there is an off ramp from from all this mm -hmm. uh, nonsense and we we can recover but I think if in the moment if we're just sitting on paper and everything is sort of okay and we want to maintain status quo uh, we're not going to be doing enough fast enough but I I'm hopeful that one day it will come I don't know if it'll be in my lifetime I don't know about you how do you feel yeah well you know I mentioned before that we're both parents and sometimes I become very caught in an unpleasant thought loop about you know what kind of planet my kid's going to live in. You know, they're 29 years old now. They live in New England and they have a great life. And I worry about that. But I also wonder if, if those conditions that were, were absent in human evolution with the ability to think, you know, beyond tonight, beyond tomorrow, beyond next week. I mean, there's proximate factors that are changing with the urgency as people see the wildfires, the floods, the hot temperatures, these horrible things that are happening. Will that be enough of a proximate change to kind of, you know, affect things? And I wondered if you think, and you can just tell me if, if you think I'm really on the wrong track here. You have a sentence in the book that pleasure, qualia, are the drivers of evolution. I think I have that right, right? I think so, something along those lines, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I was, I was thinking qualia is not a concept that I've worked with. So as you were describing it, they're kind of like the private features of, of psychological experience. So you could say that right now my qualia, as we are talking here, are I'm enjoying, I'm curious, I'm excited. I'm a little nervous that I don't screw up, that kind of thing. So that those would be qualia, right? Uh, any subjective experience yeah. of anything, I think it can be from an like a very basic emotion to uh, you know, metacognitive things like I'm not sure if I know the answer, or I'm not sure if I'm doing a good uh -huh. job. Any any experience of literally anything that is brought into the subjective experience, I think is how it would be defined, or at least okay. how I'm using it to mean. 
Okay. And so you're talking about pleasure and maybe you could just develop that argument because the, what the link I'm trying to make here is that if that of pleasure qualia are so critical to our lives and to our evolution, that doesn't fit much, right? With sitting around and thinking about <laughs> global warming and slaughterhouses and animals and laboratories, right? So there's like these, these different factors. Yeah, I, I'm tr I'm trying to come up with some uh, just some sort of framework so that I under understand the value of anything. Like why why is there any value in biology, and why therefore do we have a moral obligation toward an animal at all? You know why why care about animals in any way whatsoever? Mm -hmm. And usually it's because we're tr you know we don't want to cause suffering. Okay, well what is why? What's the problem with causing suffering? And then it always sort of comes back to well a brain is either going to experience pain or pleasure, suffering or, or pleasure. And it seems that that's true across the board for every animal. Uh, and so then the de facto uh, focus of biology becomes in a way maximization of, of, of pleasure. That's, I mean, that's basic utilitarian sort of stuff, but that seems to make the most sense to me. It explains most behavior of animals. They're just trying to uh, maximize pleasure throughout the day. And then it also explains why I should care about any animal that is suffering. I mean, Jonathan Balcom writes about this sort of stuff in, in his work as well. Um, maximizing pleasure should, because we have the capacity to understand these things, because I can mm -hmm. even talk about this and other species can't, we're under an obligation to maximize pleasure and minimize suffering. We have that capacity. And so that's what's beautiful about human intelligence. But of course the rub is, um, we, we know that and we still don't do it. We still do the wrong thing a lot of the time. I'm, does that, I mean, does that, is that too simplistic overview or does that jive kind of with your thinking when it comes to your understanding of why we should be caring about animals at all? Yeah. I mean, sometimes when I'm speaking, I will say that, you know, animals want to live. They want to live without pain and suffering. They want to have a good day. Like we come home at the end of a day and we have a good day or a bad day. And we talk to our families or our friends or our pets or whomever. And I really truly believe that in a number of different ways across all of the taxa, not always cognitively in the same way, animals are driven to want that absence of pain, that pleasure, and that it absolutely should cause us to feel motivated to want to do better and be better for animals. You know, I'm always saying that grief and love and pleasure and joy and sorrow, they don't belong to us. It's not anthropomorphic if we're looking carefully at animals to say that we see these expressions of emotions in animals. And so if we really understand that commonality of experience, doesn't that mean that, you know, in addition to not squishing the spider, should we not want to try not to eat some of these animals to the extent that we can manage that and to try not to support systems, whether it's agriculture or again, biomedical science that traps these animals in these incredibly you know, suffering situations. So I think for me, it comes back a lot to science storytelling. How do you motivate people? I mean, it's important that people find your book enjoyable, right? Isn't there a kind of thread here? You're talking about pleasure, you're talking about qualia, and you take care to make the book, you know, there's fun things to read in there, there's anecdotes, a lot of reviews have picked up on that. So you're not sort of sitting there and, you know, preaching to people about how things have to change. You're telling them stories. That's what I try to do when I write about octopus, I write about monkeys, I write about spiders. And sometimes I probably err a little bit on the side of saying, you know, we should do this. But I think that there is an interesting coming together here of the methods of how we talk to each other and the types of evolution of our brains that you're talking about. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, when I wrote this book, because like, I, I very consciously wanted to change people's minds about how they felt about animals. But I'm very aware of uh, the ways that don't work, that haven't worked in the past for me. Yeah. And, and usually if I'm just giving a story of, look how smart this animal is. This animal is brilliantly smart. Like that that might move the needle a little bit. It certainly won't move it if I'm like, you absolutely shouldn't do this because that animal, at exam people hate that. Yeah. And so in the end, what I decided to do is I'll be like, well, instead of talking about how smart animals are, let's talk about how stupid humans might be, how it might be bad to be a, a human. And that's fun. It's a fun way to get people involved. And I'm very much not preaching. I'm, I'm trying to 
not be too serious about it. But in the end, when you get to the end of the book, I hope where I've led people is to like, oh, well, maybe humans aren't so ex exceptional and where we are exceptional, maybe we're not better than animals. And maybe if animals are conscious in the sense that they have subjective experience and they can feel pleasure, including these examples I have of insects and chickens, that people will take that more seriously than the other ways of, of getting them to change their mind. So yeah, so I will I will always get a, a criticism in, in the sense that I don't come out in a hard, with a hard directive mm -hmm. about how advocacy stems naturally from these scientific facts, which of course I believe it does, mm -hmm. but I always try and be not that person. I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> convince uh, the people who are unconvinced, if that makes sense. So it's not a book for yeah. an advocate per se, which is which I understand. I completely understand how sometimes um, people don't don't like that I don't go far enough. But yes, you're right. I did write the book um, in a funny way because I think people people will respond to that. Yeah, I mean, I I'm not so successful at injecting humor into you know the slaughterhouse and the laboratory, but oh. <laughs> and I think no, what what funny. I'm trying to do is to pick up on that theme we mentioned briefly earlier about humility and to say that, you know, I'm trying to figure things out with other people. And like, I think most of us who write, I write to think, I write to figure out things. I write to answer questions that I have rather than telling other people what to do. Hmm. And sometimes my advocacy takes the form of explaining how much I've screwed up. Like even, you know, talking about the, um, the spiders, or, you know, I, I come out and say, and this is really, I don't know if it's easy to understand, but this is quite scandalous in some quarters that I'm not fully vegan. People are absolutely horrified in animal quarters when I'll say that I'm a reducitarian, I'm pretty yeah. close to vegan, I have a bunch of health issues, I can't eat the way that I want to. And so I think there's all these avenues where, you know, you can kind of have compassion, not only for other than human animals, but human animals too, and say that we're all trying to figure this out. And we're all doing, you know, it in our own way. And I think, I think that's an interesting example of how our cognition might work because of perspective taking, right? Mm -hmm. Really understanding that everybody else is in a, in a different situation. We're all trying to cope with the situations that we have in our lives, if that makes sense. Yeah. And you, you write about that in this book, because you talk mm -hmm. about different advocacy uh, uh, attempts from different kinds of uh, vegan advocates. Uh, and you talk, you're very nice about both sides. And the great thing about this book and all of your books, and I think why you have become so popular uh, with your books and with your media appearances is that you are very humble when you're writing. Like the wolf story, the wolf spider story is great because it shows that you're not coming in with the explanation of how you should behave toward animals. You're talking about your own personal evolution or different people's ideas. And I think that really, as a as someone who's talking about this, either as a scientist or as an advocate, that that people will res respond to because, like you're saying. Uh, we we see that you are human like we are. And so maybe I will listen to you as opposed to someone who seems more uh, uh, not closed minded, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. One track and not less likely to incorporate other ideas. Um, and I, I think that's just, I, your writing has always been that way. And I'm trying to do something similar myself uh, because I think that's just in the end, more effective in a sort of very, you know, basic kind of way. Well, I think your book is effective. And I and so I guess one way I'd like to begin to kind of wrap this up before we move to, to Q&A is to, to ask you, you kind of were talking about at the end, you know, people may be thinking, okay, in some ways we're exceptional, in some ways we're not. We're definitely intelligent, but we may not be better in, in, in how our minds are constructed than other animals. So, you know, yeah, we don't want to tell people what to do, but at the same time, what what do you want now? People are okay. See, people might say, "I'm in, I'm inspired by your book, Justin," and you might ask them, "What are you inspired to do?" And what do you think the answers could be? I. It starts with the animals in your life. I always say, like you, like when you walk out the door and you see a wildlife. Like I talk about the slugs in the end. Yeah, of the, book. the slug. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you see an animal that's um, that you could kill accidentally by stepping on or driving over, or that you would otherwise consider stepping on, uh, 
think twice about it. As simple as that, a simple act to realize like, oh, wait a second, having read this book, I realized that there's a mm -hmm. chance, there's a chance that that animal is conscious in the way that I am. And why, why would I just remove that animal from, from the world? So that's a, that's the most basic mm -hmm. start. Uh, but then of course you, you can, you can change your whole life around those. So you're, you come farther in the, in the end, because you're talking about life choices as it comes to uh, the foods that you eat. Um, and that's also an important thing that, that you can do. And that stems naturally from any discussion of, of what obligation we have toward animals, which is, I think what this book is trying to say. Uh, I'm, what I imagine is that there's a reader who would never entertain the idea that a bee could be conscious in any way, who by the end of this book admits it's possible. And that's yeah. all I want. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's what I'm hoping. Okay. And I, I do have another question. I know this is just such a, a sort of obvious question, but I, I'm really interested and I want to know. So what's next? I mean, are you thinking about are you ever thinking about writing about dolphins? Are you thinking about writing about other forms of human evolution consciousness studies? What what might come next? Yeah, I, the strangely enough, because because my like my agent and my my editor are like, well, let's see what people respond to. And the one thing people ask me more than anything else after reading this book is about aphantasia, oh. that, which which is the part of <laughs> what you also talked about. Yes, I did. Yes. Which was. For those who don't know, it's the uh, aphantasia is defined as the inability to create uh, conscious visualizations, um, like you can decide to see an apple in your mind's eye. Uh, people with aphantasia uh, don't have that ability, and it usually applies to other modalities as well. You probably, because Barbara, it turns out, has this, and uh, <laughs> you you probably can't imagine a song and have it play like a radio in your head, or imagine a smell and and smell it. Probably, I imagine. I I'm great with music. I can replay and I can't stop it. So I'm a little okay. different in that way, but, but well, otherwise it's, it's, well, it's a whole spectrum in terms yeah. of like, whether your mind is completely blank or some modalities. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's a, it's a relatively new term. It only cropped up in 2015 and it's a new area of research because we didn't realize it existed to, to really formally. And about 4% of the population has it. Uh, and I have it profoundly. I can do none of that in my head. And it always causes me to question, well, what does that mean about how I experience the world. And then you get into these big questions about neurodivergence and cognitive diversity mm -hmm. and what it means to think and how other people might think differently. And, and that can explain their behavior and my behavior. And so for, for whatever reason, even though that is not my area whatsoever, but, but because I have aphantasia, I'm just super interested in it. So maybe that's my next book. I don't, what well, about you? Know, I didn't bring this up because I didn't want to end up talking endlessly about my experience of reading your book. But, you know, of course, I had your book in in galleys right before it was published and I'm reading it and, you know, I'm enjoying it. And then I come to this page and and um, I hadn't I haven't reread this. So I'm just remembering. But you were saying something about you were with a friend and you're talking about, you know, you were asking are you really suggesting that people could imagine a beach scene or a red apple? No, no, that doesn't happen. And the person informed you that, yes, it happens to most people. And you were like, uh, not me. And I ran from the room holding your book <laughs> into my husband. And I said, can you imagine a beach scene? And he said, well, of course, we've been married 32 years. I had I no idea. Yeah. And he looked at me like, you know, um, he's the most supportive, wonderful person. And he said, Barbara, what are you talking about? Can you <laughs> not imagine a beach scene? And we, you know, the whole day stopped. So I yeah. completely get that because I started from that moment forward only because of your book, reading, 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 talking to people. Yeah. So yeah, go with it. I, I'm fascinated. I, I agree. And my wife has put a ban on me talking about it because it's the one thing I will not stop talking about. Because it, again, it, it amazes me that I didn't understand. Every time someone yeah. said, picture an apple, I thought that they meant think of an apple. Yes. I, it, I was just flabbergasted. You can actually see it. That sounds insane to me. I know. I know. <laughs> wow. How exciting. Oh, okay, before I get back into too much mental imagery of apples, uh, maybe we could move to the Q&A at this point. Okay. <laughs> Thank you both so much. This has absolutely been fascinating. What a wonderful, uh, wonderful, wonderful evening. Um, thank you both. Uh, well, we've got a question already from the audience, and it is uh, an anonymous one. She says, or they ask, when discussing mortality, we most frequently assign the emotions felt with a recognition that we will some we will someday die. But in my observational experience around animals, it's that the death of another is also the death of that relationship and that phase in their lives. Can you discuss the death of the immediate and what we may learn from animals in this regard? 
Barbara, that is all you. That is your specialty. <laughs> the death of the immediate. Yes, I think one way that I think about this is looking at animals who are grieving a very specific individual, a mate, a friend, a child, and looking to see whether or not they are what we call resilient and recover. Because just like with people, there are different depths and gradations of grief. And it is very much that loss of a relationship. And so I think to the degree that many animals that I have studied do go on to find another way to get those relationship needs met by you know, grooming another group of monkeys by seeking another close friend, if you're a horse or a dog or a giraffe or, or something, is, is very interesting um, because the immediate is a loss, but then there's a way to go forward. And then there are some animals, and I talk about this in, in my TED talk, who simply don't recover, who just cannot get over that loss at all. There, Even though there are other potential partners around, other ways of potentially getting relationship needs met, that doesn't happen and the individual doesn't recover. So in some ways, you know, that can be upsetting. But on the whole, when I think about this, in terms of what we can learn from animals, I think to me, it has to do with the fact that we see that this grief really is emergent from love. And I'm not too nervous about using that word for other animals. I know that it is often charged with, you know, someone saying you're projecting Barbara as anthropomorphism, Barbara. But I also think that if animals are spending time together over and above survival benefits, they are absolutely entwined in their lives and how they spend time and, and, and really just care deeply for each other. There's not a particularly good reason to avoid that word. And there's a number of scientists who are doing that. So I think that for me, it's a feeling of being in a world of emotion, a world of love. And from that love, the outcome is grief, but we're not alone in that. And that is really, really powerful to me. It's powerful to make me feel not alone in the world in a multi-species sense. And it's powerful to me as a motivator to, again, to treat animals well. Oh, thank you. Um, please, if anyone has any questions, type them into the Q&A box at the bottom or into the chat, um, and I'll be happy to pose them for you. Um, I've got a question for you both. And um, that is uh, one of my favorite essayists is uh, the, the writer John Berger. And he has a wonderful essay called Why Look at Animals, in which he discusses how the emergence of the zoo and also uh, stuffed animals, how we conceive them as sort of the little commodified versions of, of animals or uh, animals in and human clothes, these sort of humanized versions, all emerge at a time of industrialization when people are sort of um, uh, moving away from the, sort of the daily life of animals. Uh, and I was wondering if you could sort of speak to that, of having animals in their, their daily lives and their daily experience and sort of that connection with a, a person and their horse or um, out in the rural world. Um, can you talk to that a little bit about that connection um, that seems to be lost with, in the, with, with zoos and things like that? If that makes sense. Yeah, Barbara, you, you know more about zoos, but but I can just say anecdotally uh, that if you look at pretty much any culture on this planet and the things that you teach babies first <laughs> and the books that you show them, there are almost always animals involved. The names of animals, the sounds that animals make, animals as protagonists in stories, anthropomorphized animals. It is uh, just at the core of who we are is a relationship to and with uh, animals. Um, and so then, but then you get to this industrialized version and zoos and things. And Barbara, maybe you can talk more about where we are now as a species where that in that area. Yeah, I think the we here is really important to clarify because if you're thinking yeah. anthropologically and thinking cross culturally, there are tons and tons, meaning billions, of people who do live in very, very close quarters with animals. And I'm not just talking about, say, you know, uh, places where I did my field work, which would be in Kenya when I was walking around after baboons or something like that. But there are many parts of this country as well where there's subsistence hunting that still goes on, where there's very close relationship with animals. So I understand completely that you're talking about this sort of um, alienation in many of our lives from natural rhythms of animals, but globally that may not be the case. Hmm. So where it is the case and we have animals in zoos, 
I think that it is a very unnatural thing to go there and to show our kids, you know, here is a giraffe, here's a lion, here's a monkey, because you're not really seeing those animals at all. One of my real heroes is the photojournalist Joanne MacArthur, who is Canadian, and she lives in Toronto, and she goes around the world to document different conditions under which animals live, and she has a book called Captive, that is a book of photos and text from zoos around the world, and she issues a challenge to people who go to zoos, and that is to stay for some hours in front of a zoo, in uh, sorry, one zoo cage, one particular enclosure, and not leave, and not do the five minutes here and five minutes there, and really watch and understand that that animal does not have the ability to turn around and walk out of the exit at the end of the day and to see what kind of behavior that animal is capable of and is constrained from doing. And that will really allow you to see in some ways that the zoo is an incredibly alienating place for animals. So I'm not a particular fan of a lot of zoos and I do think that a lot of the conservation uh, work that goes on and other work that goes on can be done without confining animals in the way that they are now, that it doesn't help them, certainly. And I, I don't think it helps us really understand the profundity of animal lives in the way that Justin's been writing and talking about. I'll ask a question to Barbara, because if, 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 this brings me to a thing I was going to ask you on my list of questions, which is, uh, you you talked about uh, the writer Manisha Decca, and you quote her as having said that we have a call to imagine relations with animals anew, and specifically it was about sort of non-Western cultures relation to animals. So what we're kind of talking about here, as you point out, is sort of this uh, industrialized Western way of thinking about our relationship to animals, but mo many cultures still have a much closer relationship. So is that what she is saying is to to rethink our relationship away from this sort of, uh, you know, stark industrial uh, functional relationship to animals and put them back in our lives in a more, uh, I assume, compassionate way? Well, one thing that she talks about is that we need to read and learn from indigenous scholars who come from a number of cultural traditions and that not all indigenous scholars end up saying the same thing, even about a process like hunting. So that is one lesson that I, that I take from her. And she has motivated me to try to learn more of that indigenous perspective and wisdom by reading indigenous writers. And of course, one hugely famous book is Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. I don't know if you've read that, Justin. I, I yeah, it is okay. on my, my table. <laughs> it should be being read. <laughs> Okay, um, so Dr. Kimmerer is a botanist, a college professor, and a person who is indigenous. And she writes in these amazing ways about the wisdom that we can learn from plants and animals and that there is an animating life force in, in, in all of these ways. So that I think a lot of what uh, some of us, you know, who are coming from our particular traditions are trying to to say is, is reinventing in a different way what has been around for such a long period of time that we have to understand and try to promote and conserve the natural lives of these animals. And in, a, in the way that the earth is now with all the, har the anthropogenic harms, it's very, very difficult because we have to preserve the landscape in order to preserve the life ways of the animals. So I'm getting a little off track here, but I think what I'm basically saying is that we all need to be reading and talking you know, beyond our own experiences because there's so much wisdom in this world that is not Western that, that we need to be in, right in there with it. Yeah, and, and I could say here in, in Canada, um people who talk in the environment movement and we're talking about climate change and solving problems as a community going forward, people say one of the main things we need to do is speak with the indigenous communities that are already here, that are under, we're under obligation through treaties to incorporate them and their knowledge in our governance and going forward. Uh, and we haven't really in Canada done that very well, but the way forward is to incorporate that knowledge into our thinking to transform our uh, the way we live. And that will, of course, bring with it those, as you point out, diverse perspectives, but, but all very different from Western perspectives on how we relate to our environment and the animals in that environment. Yeah, we're way, way late with this stuff and we need to, to do a better job. 
Um, Barbara, Justin, thank you both so much. This has been a wonderful event. Um, thank you for joining us. You can order Nietzsche Were a Narwhal from Northshire here, and you can order uh, Animals Best Friends at this link here. And can I slip in one more question? So Justin, you're you're on Twitter, right? I am. Okay, and that's a place we can find you and think with you. I supposedly I'm on Justin D. Gregg at Twitter. As long as it continues to exist, I think I'll probably be on there doing something. <laughs> and okay. you as well. And I'm BJ King Ape, and I believe we're both on Mastodon as well now, right? I'm just trying to figure it out. I don't know. How's that going for you? I'm I'm liking it. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm you know, meeting all kinds of new people and and understanding the system. So I just thought, you know, if if you people out there who are listening or also listening to the recording would like to send questions or talk with us. I imagine that's one way to do it, Justin, right? Absolutely. That's definitely the best way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I enjoyed this conversation greatly. Thank you. This was fantastic. Me too. Uh, thank you, everyone. And we'll see you at another Northshire Presents virtual event sometime soon. Take care, everyone. Have a great evening. Bye. <laughs>